medieval England would experience a number of revolts, however none were more serious or severe than the peasants' revolt that occurred in June 1381. It was a time in which many of the population, and in particular the peasants, were unhappy with their king and how England was being run. It was a time where the Black Death had just decimated England, and there was a shortage of people left to work the land. The peasants would soon realise the importance of supply and demand, and they began to consider their worth, demanding higher wages, better freedoms, and also better working conditions. However, the peasants' revolt was not a peaceful protest by any means. There was much bloodshed, anger, and also chaos brought to London, when the rebels would enter the capital. Join us today as we look at the brutal peasants' revolt of 1381, and remember to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. The peasants in England were rather unhappy. The Black Death had just wiped out a large amount of the peasant working population, and for this they were needed to go and work in new areas, and were attracted to different employers, with the promise of greater wages. So peasants would move and earn greater money, However, a law called the Statute of Labourers was introduced. This fixed peasants' wages to pre-plague levels, and for this the peasants were furious. They were also angry at the fact they were forced to pay a new tax called the Poll Tax. This was introduced by Richard II to pay for the long conflict and war with France. This would not have been a great amount of money for a lord or a bishop to have paid, but for a peasant it could be crippling to pay more taxes. Peasants also had to work for free, on church land sometimes, up to two days a week, and this meant they could not work on their own land, meaning it was difficult for them to gather enough food for their families. In May 1381, a tax collector arrived in a village in Essex called Fobbing to investigate why no one had paid their poll tax, and he was subsequently thrown out by the villagers. In June, a group of soldiers would return to the village, but they were also thrown out of Fobbing, and the local villagers along with other settlements in Essex joined together and decided to march to London to plead with the king about their case, and also to get what they wanted from the young boy king. The protests involving the peasants would grow and grow, and the peasants in particular blamed the king's advisers, such as the Archbishop of Canterbury, Simon Sudbury, and also the Duke of Lancaster, John of Gaunt. It seemed that the uprising was rather well organised, and the peasants set off for London on the 2nd of June en masse. The villages from the north of the River Thames, from Essex, Norfolk and Suffolk, would converge on the capital through Chelmsford, and those from the south from Kent would attack Rochester Castle, and then Sudbury's town of Canterbury, before arriving on the outskirts of London. A man named Watt Tyler would emerge as the elected leader of the rebellion, and he was seen as a charismatic and capable leader. In Canterbury, the rebels would force entry into the castle in the city and depose the absent Archbishop of Canterbury, forcing the monks to swear loyalty to their cause. They also attacked many properties in the city, linked to the Royal Council, and searched for their enemies, dragging out the suspects and subsequently executing them on the streets. The rebels even went into the city's jail and opened the gates letting all of the prisoners run free. As forces approached London, they were armed with many weapons, including battle axes, swords and bows. On the 10th of June 1381, the king would hear of the rebellion, and would travel down the River Thames by boat from Windsor Castle to take up residence inside the Tower of London, a powerful fortress for his own safety. He was joined by the Archbishop, as well as other senior members of the government and the king's advisers. Discussions about how to deal with the revolt would take place, with the king short on soldiers, as much of the military might were involved in campaigns in places such as Germany and France. The rebels would cross to London Bridge on the 13th of June, and the defences were opened from the inside, allowing the peasants inside the city. The rebels from Kent had compiled a big list of those they wished to be executed, including Archbishop Simon Sudbury, and it wouldn't be long before he would be dead. Inside London, the group swelled in their numbers, and fleet to Newgate prisons were attacked by the crowds in an attempt to free the prisoners. A local priory in a nearby manor was also destroyed, with the rebels attacking the temple, a series of legal buildings held by the military order, the Hospitallers. The records and books of the institution were all burned in the streets, and their attentions turned to the Savoy Palace. 
The Savoy was a huge and ornate building, belonging to the disliked John of Gaunt. It contained incredible riches and gold, and the value of the contents inside was huge. The rebels stormed inside the palace and destroyed the palace room by room, burning all the soft furnishings inside the rooms and smashing the precious metals inside. They even crushed the gemstones that were held there and threw the remains of the records inside the River Thames and the drains. Then the building was set on fire and the rebels would turn their attention to an even bigger target, a symbol of the king and the monarchy's power, the Tower of London. The Tower of London is still seen today as an impenetrable fortress, but during the Peasants' Revolt it was targeted. The crowd on the morning of the 14th of June burned the houses of officials around Westminster and opened the jail there. They then continued to burn even more buildings. The scene was brutal, executed men's bodies lined the streets, and inside the tower the King's government was in a state of shock. The events were incredibly bloody, but the king left the tower in the morning to try and negotiate with the rebels. He left Simon Sudbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury, at the tower, but whilst the king was out negotiating, the tower was stormed. The gates were raided by 400 rebels, who entered the Tower of London with no resistance, and the guards were left terrified. Inside, they began to hunt down key targets, and they found the Archbishop of Canterbury, Sudbury, and another key target, Robert Hales, hiding inside the chapel of the White Tower. Along with more adjutants, the party were dragged out of the tower and beheaded in horrific fashion by the mob on Tower Hill. Their heads were then paraded around the city, before being put onto London Bridge. The rebels would then, in the evening of the 14th of June, continue to lay siege to London, storming around the city, trying to find the employees of their targets, foreigners and anyone associated with the legal system or the courts. They would then execute them in the streets. It was clear that the mob had made a prominent stand, storming the impenetrable Tower of London and also causing huge destruction and devastation across the English capital. This forced King Richard to consider meeting the rebels once more and on the 15th of June it was agreed for the king to meet the rebel leader, Watt Tyler, and a crowd at Smithfield in London. During this meeting, more bloodshed would occur. Richard called over Tyler from the crowd to meet with him, and initially the meeting seemed positive. Tyler would refer to the king as his brother, however the rebel leader would request further legal changes, and that they were put in place by the king and the government. He wanted the lives of peasants to be made easier, however the king did seem to be hesitant to make these changes. With this, an argument would break out between Watt Tyler and the royal adjutants and servants. At some point, the mayor of London, William Walworth, went forward to step in, and Tyler, who made some movement or attempt to grab the king or seize him, was attacked by the mayor and the royal servants. Tyler allegedly lunged towards the king, and with this, the mayor stabbed Tyler after he was also attacked. A royal squire then stabbed Tyler to death repeatedly using his sword, and it was incredibly tense. The leader of the rebels had been killed by the king's allies, and it was probable that more violence would occur. The rebels were ready to unleash a volley of arrows at the royal party, however the young King Richard would manage to calm the situation down, and following this the revolt did die down. Tyler's head for his involvement was placed on a spike, with the rebellion's leader's death being seen as a sign of the king's rule. The Peasants' Revolt as we know it, and the events that took place in London, were not the only uprisings to take place in 1381 within England. Revolts by peasants would occur all across the country, and this will be a subject of a future video. However, the bloodshed and barbarism displayed within the English capital really reinforced the unhappiness of the peasants, and that their cause was a believed a just one. They would stop at no end to get what they wanted, even if it meant the execution of scores of people, including the influential Archbishop of Canterbury, one of the most important people in the whole country. Once again, thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe, and once again, thank you so much for watching.